You can hear my voice, so that means that the microphone is on. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you may be online today. A warm welcome to this conference, which is entitled Building a Stronger EU Integrity Framework, and which has been convened by the European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly. My name's James Cantor. I'm a journalist. I'm the host of the politics podcast at EU Scream, and I'm your moderator for this event. We'll be discussing EU ethics and integrity, but we'll also be discussing uh, the EU's legitimacy and its democratic credentials ahead of next year's European elections. Recently, we've seen corporate and third country actors, uh, and evidence of that just a few meters from where we're sitting, uh, ready to spend seemingly unlimited amounts to subvert EU decision making. So, can the prospect of the EU institutions continuing to self-regulate, uh, continuing to self-police, can that be enough to stop the kind of debasement of ethics that we've seen in other parts of the democratic world? To open this important and timely event, I'd first like to welcome the European Omb Ombudsman to say a few words. Thank you. Ombudsman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, and good morning, everyone, and uh, you're very welcome. And I thank you for taking the time to join us today to discuss the creation of a stronger EU integrity framework, and I thank our speakers in particular for accepting the invitation to engage in public debate. So, as James already said, today's event is taking place six months after Cattergate prompted a laser-sharp focus on how the EU safeguards its integrity and, by extension, its credibility and its legitimacy. Those six months have shown us, however, that the creation of a strong ethical framework sufficient to withstand what Parliament President Metzola described in the immediate aftermath of Cattergate as an attack on our democracy is not straightforward. The clarity and apparent unity of approach of the early days of the crisis has been replaced by complex debate around the legal basis for certain measures, by concerns about the independence of the mandate of MEPs, and by other issues, political, legal, and administrative, that have slowed the finalization of detailed reform. We are, of course, dealing with systems and with cultures around ethical conduct that go far deeper than the crude bribery alleged in Cattergate. We are trying to construct a defence system around and within our institutions capable of protecting the interests of EU citizens from undue or malign influence on those responsible for creating and administering our laws. Because let us not forget that the influencing of legislation, the securing of support for questionable regimes, can be and is done in ways that don't necessarily include the drama of the suitcases and bags of cash of this particular scandal. When a private company handpicks an EU official from a key regulatory DG to get the inside track on legislation vital to that company, or an influential, well-networked former MEP or commissioner is engaged in order for private interests to access that network. Influence is being sought, just as it was allegedly, allegedly sought in Cattergate. Much of this has, of course, benign and legitimate intent. The question is how to distinguish the benign from the malign, deal with it before it does harm, or sanction it if the harm has already been caused. My work as European Ombudsman in this area is essentially about influence. Is EU legislation being influenced in ways that dilute the public interest and that are enabled by a failure to deal with conflicts of interest, a lack of transparency, a lax revolving door regime, and with rules that are either not followed or not enforced? On revolving doors alone, our, ombud, our ombuds prudence runs to hundreds of pages of analysis and recommendations for improvements. Improvements do come, but often incrementally and often slowly. I have often thought that if the money paid as legitimate salaries or fees 
and not as illegal bribes to some of those who have made the jump from regulator to regulated were made visible. That reform would no longer be quite so incremental or quite so slow. We have launched inquiries into the systemic issues around this area, as well as individual revolving doors cases relating to the European Investment Bank, the European Banking Authority, the European Defence Agency and the European Commission, among others. Some cases required fine, context-dependent judgment and careful discrimination to extract black and white conclusions from the grey, although some were very straightforward indeed. So I think we can all agree that reform is needed, and what we need therefore to discuss are the genuine obstacles to reform and those obstacles that are put there simply to block it. We also need to look at the ways in which the existing integrity framework, represented here by my office, by OLAF and by the European Court of Auditors, is sufficiently engaged with and respected by the wider administration. The two key players in this reform are Commission Vice President Jourova, charged with EU values and transparency, and Parliament President Roberta Metzola. But neither leader, no matter how strong their personal commitment, how excellent their bona fides, can push effective reform through without wide political and administrative support. And the strength of that support will determine the type of reform package that emerges. President Metzola's 14-point reform plan is working its way through the various committees and bodies required to give it concrete expression. On Thursday, Vice President Jourova will present the Commission's proposal for a new interinstitutional ethics body that will, make, that will agree, we understand, common standards for its member institutions, including the Commission and the European Parliament. There will not be a quick fix, but as the broad shape of these reforms is becoming known, we can discuss whether they will address the root causes of the integrity gaps exposed by Cattergate. President Metzler's plan is intended to increase the transparency of lobby activities in the Parliament and impose greater constraints on former MEPs who become lobbyists, that is, if it's fully implemented. The new ethics body will, we understand, create for the first time a permanent forum for different EU institutions and bodies to discuss ethical standards and to hold each other to account for poor implementation, and all of that is very welcome. But since Cattergate, the citizens of the EU have become a bit more literate and knowledgeable about what a good ethics regime should look like. And what they may well question is the extent to which self-regulation will remain a feature of a new regime, and particularly in the Parliament and the Commission. Abandoning or significantly reforming self-regulation may be what is needed to make this reform both credible and really effective. But no matter what new regime is put in place, culture will ultimately determine everything. EU institutions are very good at making rules. The reform of an embedded culture is much, much more difficult. As an ombudsman, I have found that the strongest and best administrations are those not with the longest list of rules, but rather those whose culture of integrity is so firmly entrenched that they barely need any at all. A weak new body will be devoured by a weak ethical culture, and changing that culture is the challenge for those who lead our institutions. In short, we should be clear-sighted about the limitations of any new body. Solutions will not be handed down from on high. The hard work will continue to rest at the door of each separate institution, but hopefully supported by a new body that will insist on the highest of standards. So I look forward to an open and frank discussion. It has never been more vital in a world that seems in parts to be tilting away from the democratic values that are the lifeblood of the Union, that the Union gets this right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And I now hand back to James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Before we get going, some basic housekeeping. Our hashtag for social media is hashtag EO debate. That's hashtag EO debate. Second, we'll aim to turn to you, our audience, for Q&A. 
in about 50 minutes to an hour from now. And when I call on you, please kindly give your name and any affiliation. And please do participate. We, we do want a range of views. And now to our panel, uh, I first introduce uh, Vera Yorova, who is the European Commission's Vice President for Values and Transparency. Back in 2019, President von der Leyen put Ms. Yorova in charge of developing an independent ethics body common to all EU institutions. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone, and then I'll bring you in, and I think we can just sit where we are for this. I am calmly sitting, <laughs> not doing anything. <laughs> Try and get a conversation going as well. Um, and just to finish up, uh, Ms. Yorova's uh, uh, long CV. Uh, excellent CV. She was uh, previously Minister for Regional Development in the Czech Republic, and formerly, and many of us will remember that, uh, the European Commissioner for Justice. Katerina Barley uh, is a European Parliament Vice President. And her portfolio includes transparency issues. She was elected to the parliament in 2019, leading the SPD list in Germany. Ms. Barley has previously served as Germany's justice minister, among other ministerial portfolios. And she's also been secretary general of the SPD and worked as a lawyer. And now from the existing oversight bodies, uh, I'm pleased to welcome George Hissler. Uh, Mr. Hissler is uh, a member of the European Court of Auditors, which is tasked with ensuring that EU's tax taxpayer money is well spent. And Mr. Hissler was appointed Malta's first ever commissioner for standards in public life in Malta in 2018. And his reports led to the resignation of two members of cabinet. He's also a former member of the Maltese parliament and a former government minister. We also welcome uh, Vil Italia, Etala, Pardon me. Uh, Mr. Itala is Director General of the European Anti-Fraud Office, known as OLAF. Mr. Itala served in the early 2000s as Finland's Interior Minister. He's been Chairman of Finland's National Coalition Party. And in Europe, he's previously been a member of the European Parliament, as well as a member of the European Court of Auditors. And now, um, Vice President Jourova, it's my pleasure to invite you to speak first for a few minutes. You can sit there or take the podium, as, as you wish. <laughs> and uh, we're all waiting to see what will be formally announced Thursday on the long-deferred ethics body. Uh, does it come anywhere close to matching the expectations of citizens in the wake of Qatargate? Please. I will go there because uh, from there I will have more dominance in the... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Madame O'Reilly, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, quite an important moment for me because this is just two days before we will um, agree in the Commission on the competencies, composition, and uh, scope of the of the first ever European uh, ethics body. And I want to start by quoting what Madame, Madame O'Reilly uh, just said. It has uh, never been more vital uh, than now uh, to, to discuss and to do uh, more to increase the trust of, of the people in EU institutions. The trust is low, not only regarding EU institutions and EU as such. According to the latest Eurobarometer, I think it's 47%. Uh, who is higher, local, local um, offices, local municipal uh, councils, medical services, army, police. Uh, so we are at, at 47. <clears throat> but uh, what's more uh, difficult to swallow than these numbers is the overall atmosphere, and especially after the Qatar gate, but also by after some, some other events, uh, uh, the people in Europe are telling us, uh, what are you doing there? What's, what's the standard? What's the moral? Uh, we have elected you and uh, you misbehave. I, I am simplifying that, but you said what are the expectations from the EU citizens. So my guess is that they want us to correct it. And they, and, and we know we have to correct it quickly because the elections are upcoming. And uh, I think that we all want to see high turnout in the elections. 
And I think that uh, we want the people who trust that they can change something with their vote, they will come and cast their vote. So these are these are connected connected things, uh, the trust and uh, and the interest of the people in in elections. Uh, I think today we will speak about the architecture of of different levels, different bodies, different structures, uh, which uh, should work together. And let me maybe enumerate the, the elements of it. For me, the number one pillar of the ethics uh, architecture, architecture of ethics is the moral integrity of each of the members, each politician who work in the EU institutions. Let's not skip that, because uh, we need to see full transparency for uh, the activities and, and work of the, of the politicians. And we want to see, now we, I, see, I, see, I say it uh, from uh, the side of the, of the citizens, we want to see high moral and we want to see the, the high ethical standards being, being followed. Uh, I heard in the European Parliament that without the ethics body, uh, there will be no ethics. And I heavily, I sharply disagree with that. Because if somebody says it who received the trust of his, it was her, her voters, uh, I, I would not be able to say that. It's my own decision to enter politics and it's my responsibility uh, to uh, provide a transparent service to the citizens and uh, while, while doing that keeping high, high moral standards. Uh, the second part of the story is, uh, are the codes of, uh, of ethics of each institution. I speak about each institution. I have in mind the institutions under Article uh, 13, uh, where we have nine institutions. And um, each of them has a different role, different position in democratic system, different duties, different sensitivities, and different, uh, also different space for misbehavior. <laughs> and, and here I, I want to say we must not forget that each of these institutions have their codes and have their professional staff who have to go after disciplinary issues. And I will always emphasize that, that without these structures functioning well, we will not be able to correct what has been damaged. The third thing are the institutions which deal with uh, criminal offenses. Uh, again, the story about briefcases full of money, well, it's probably money uh, which has the, the origin in some criminal activity. So it's uh, for Olaf, it's uh, for EPPO, in case it is covering the, uh, the sus suspicion covers the EU money, or the national prosecution, if it is uh, something else. But it's, uh, uh, we have institutions which, which have to cover these, these criminal offenses. What's missing? I do believe, and I work hard on creation of something which, which I believe is missing, and it's the ethics body which should cover all nine institutions, uh, which will be too much for some and too little for others. And uh, when... Uh, uh, can I? Yes, two, two more minutes? Absolutely, thank <laughs> because you. Because now I am becoming passionate, <laughs> explaining the reactions of different institutions. So, so listen, in 2020, I uh, sent a letter, or I think Ursula sent a letter, simply the Commission sent a letter to all the institutions uh, as, as the invitation for the debate about the ethics body. Uh, we received quick no from most of them. We received a hesitant yes from the Committee of Regions and Committee of, of uh, uh, Economic and Social Affairs. And uh, I very much like the, the saying which I, I got from uh, Margaret Vestager. Uh, she said, it's always better to receive slow yes than quick no. I received quick no in 2020. And we knew that we have to do again and better, which means first to consult there and back. I spoke to all the presidents 
some vice presidents. I spoke to the professional staff. We really have two, two years uh, of, of, uh, of heavy consultations. I spoke to Madame O'Reilly about that three, two years, uh, two, 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 two times. And uh, now we are coming with the proposal uh, where I hope uh, will, uh, which uh, will establish the, the, the body which will receive a strong yes, slow but strong yes. Uh, uh, what I understand from the reactions, uh, the, in the European Parliament there is not a unified voice. The resolution said that the body should have investigative powers, should go after individual cases, should be allowed, should be uh, authorized to uh, check the uh, uh, declarations of assets and the after mandate activities and uh, uh, this is not what I am proposing. I am proposing the standard setting body, uh, which will uh, uh, also serve as the platform where all the nine institutions will be represented. And the, these all will work together on uh, est establishing the, the set of standards. I can go later on, on which standards on what. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is what uh, will come on Thursday. Uh, Believe me or not, I still don't know the final version of it because now Hebdo is sitting on it. These are influential people, the, the heads of our cabinets. And so I am curious what will be the result. There are still several un unclear matters and one important. So uh, thank you for giving me this space. I was said uh, I, it will be uh, immediately discussion, but of course I had to use it properly and long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Yorova. Um, Ms. Barley, uh, Vice President Barley, can I invite you next to say a few words, perhaps in response to uh, Ms. Yorova, just, just a few minutes, just some, sure. some responses. I got it. But in response to Ms. Yorova, but also on how our 705 member parliament can end a system of, well, you know, pure self policing, which is what we currently have. Um, yes, well, thank you very much, first of all, for this invitation to this very distinguished panel, and I'm sure a very distinguished audience, too. Um, well, it comes to no surprise to you that Qatar Gate really shook us up. I mean, everybody knows that where power is, there is temptation and there is corruption, but this sort of scandal, I think, uh, nobody would have expected a colleague to sit on suitcases and bags full of money underneath their baby's bed or something like that. At least that was my, um, that was my first reaction to it. And um, you mentioned it, I'm responsible for transparency and Vera Jourova and myself and the council, the German council, uh, presidency at the time, had the, the pleasure to negotiate the, the uh, transparency um, register and to form an interinstitutional inter agreement. Um, and looking back, um, I would say it went so smooth, and it did, um, because probably the point of following and endorsing um, was seen by a lot of people in all the institutions that not so important, and that they maybe already realised we we then have a nice have nice rules, but let's see if they are really being followed and endorsed, and they have not been, as we have seen. Um, so Parliament is accountable to citizens um, probably, well, even more than, than the other institutions. The MEPs are in the spotlight. They have to be elected uh, every five years if they want to. So I think the ethical standards that have been mentioned should be, I mean, absolutely self-explaining for every single MEP. Um, of course, for every civil servant too, for every member of the commission. But I think for MEPs, it is even um, it is a core part of, of what they have to stand for. So um, we are currently reforming um, the framework of integrity and transparency, as has already been mentioned. I don't have to touch too much upon this. We've had two resolutions in uh, 2022 and 2023 that go very far, especially when it comes to the ethics body. 
Uh, Commissioner Jourova mentioned it um, in, in the resolution. We ask for a very strong ethics body with uh, power to investigate, uh, to make concrete proposals. Um, and um, these are not that these these proposals are not in the 14 points um, uh, as explicitly as that. Um, but uh, the Parliament has expressed this will. Now, what do the 705 members think? Of course, they do not have a coherent opinion and voice. And uh, we have seen that, for example, when it came to the cooling off period that has already <clears throat> been voted in uh, in the Bureau. Um, it has become a six months cooling off period. Um, a lot of political forces, for me this is difficult now, I mean of course I'm wearing two hats, um, ask for a lot more. Uh, 24 months um, is, is the maximum period of time that you can uh, have uh, transitory payment. I lack the, the word now. Um, after you, after you uh, leave the parliament, so th this would have been sort of logical to adjust the two. Uh, it has not been done. It was a tight decision, as I said. Um, but uh, yeah, there you see. Um, of course, we we have constant discussions that go between freedom of mandate being strengthened very hardly to the need for transparency that has always been there, but is there even more now after this uh, terrible scandal. Um, and yes, we are moving along. We are moving forward with the 14 points. Um, some hope that they will not be the only measures that will be taken, but even that is, um, is not a unanimous uh, opinion. So I'm very curious to see the proposal of the Commission and uh, looking forward to the, to the discussion on it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Garley. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to, without uh, delay, uh, get some response from our oversight bodies that we're very lucky to have on the panel uh, today to get them to shed a little bit more light on what's been said. Uh, this is sort of a quick response round, maybe two to three minutes, if that's okay. We'll come back to you for a deeper dive. Um, I'd like to start with you, Mr. Hissler. Um, as we've heard, the new ethics body would harmonize would aim to harmonize transparency uh, standards in nine EU institutions, but it won't have investigative or sanctioning powers. Um, wh what do you make of Ms. Yorova's proposals uh, and, and what Ms. Barley said? Um, well, first of all, it's, it's all a question of ensuring citizens' trust in the European institutions. So what are we trying to achieve? Will this new body help to increase that trust? And I do believe that harmonized standards could do that, could help, uh, could contribute in that direction. Uh, because there are, every institution has its own code of ethics, <clears throat> but the interpretation of the rules lies within that institution, and they are interpreted differently. Of course, um, so as far as harmonized standards are concerned, common interpretation of standards, I would have personally absolutely no problem with that. I would, do, I would and when I say I would, the Court of Auditors would have a problem with relinquishing uh, jurisdiction of, as regards investigation and sanctioning of its members and staff. Uh, that is, is grounded in the treaty where uh, for instance, just by way of example, if a, if a member of the Court of Auditors uh, had to um, be found, uh, uh, had to be accused of misconduct, it's up to the Court of Justice to impose the sanctions. And so I don't think uh, that it's a matter of relinquishing or changing that rule as such. We do have that as well. We do have that already in place. We also have in place standards that are not standards only designed by the Court of Auditors, but we, we form part of uh, standards set by Intersai, and we abide by those standards that are applicable to auditors in, 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 in uh, um, public, public, public service. So uh, any initiative that will strengthen the citizens' trust in the European institutions and the European project, I would certainly be support. But the thing is, how would this contribute? Because if we take Qatar Gate as an example, Qatar Gate is a straightforward case of corruption. 
if that, if that were to be the case. No code of ethics could address that particular problem. What we could say is this. The European citizen would judge us by the way we handle how we react to a problem of this nature. So human nature being what it is, I don't think that the citizen is surprised that there could be a case of corruption. It's not right, of course. But the European citizen expects us to react at zero tolerance in the case that, that arises. So my point, my point is, and I, in my previous life, I, I was responsible in politics for, for consumer protection. I used to tell the ordinary trader, you know, when you have a complaint, in a way, thank God, because you will be judged by how you treat that complaint. Because, you know, a product could be defective, fine. But if you treat it well, you've got a customer who will come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hissler. Thank you very much. And um, yes, I think in the context of the European Court of Auditors, uh, what I understand is that peer pressure has uh, really been exercised a bit more strongly since some of the ethical questions uh, uh, arose around, around the work of the court. Uh, Mr. Itala of Olaf, your initial response, please, to what we heard from Ms. Yorova and uh, Ms. Barley. And Mr. Hisler, for that matter, your two to three minutes, please. Yes, thank you. First of all, of course, we, we support Eurova's proposal to get stronger uh, with the fight against uh, corruption and fraud. And uh, during the years we have seen this happening, not maybe with a so big case that Qatar get this, but I think now it's a momentum to improve. And uh, we have discussed a lot that it's uh, ethics body important, but not to have a, a duplication with our work. Because there is Olaf, there is EPO, there is uh, like Belgium police working with this uh, field too. So there is already quite many players. Why to increase? But uh, if I understood right, it's not there. So thank you for, for that. But the main point here is what I want to say. Even the ethics body, it might be not enough. As the colleagues already said here, it's a question of implementation of the regulations. We have a lot of regulation already in place. But like Olaf, we have uh, difficulties with the parliament, with the other institutions too, not only with the parliament, but now we are talking about parliament case here. And, uh, in the regulation, it's clear that we have the mandate to, to lo look the members if they conduct any uh, fraud. And, uh, but the parliament don't uh, let us go to the members' uh, offices to investigate. We cannot uh, look the IT equipment. So it's impossible. Regulation is there, but the parliament is not implementing. So I have to say, let us do our work. It will be the big step already. Thank you. And perhaps you could expand on that. I mean, the, there is a mandate that OLAF has, but that mandate has not been accepted by all of the institutional players. And what you're appealing for here today is for that to change. Yes, absolutely. There are different ways, like in fact, Parliament has uh, uh, signed the inter-institutional uh, uh, agreement 99, but somehow they don't just let us to go, and we don't fight with the uh, security service guys to, <laughs> to try to go to the offices. Then we just don't go. But then there are some uh, uh, instances like uh, Court of Justice who has not signed this, and there we, it's a shame that. But this concerns the members. In the parliament, we can uh, investigate the stuff, but not the members. And can I, can I, before we go to Mr. Hissler, can I follow up on that a little bit more and say, well, had you had some of these uh, investigative powers over the parliament, might we be in a position where Qatargate never happened? Because after all, it was the Belgians that, as we understand it, stepped in and did the investigative work. 
We are in, in theory, of course, if we have investigated the people concerned. We could see these uh, issues maybe in theory uh, uh, beforehand, so it, it's possible. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hissler, uh, we've already leapt into uh, one of the most important parts of this panel, I think, which is what kind of pushback are the oversight agencies uh, experiencing? Um, and uh, especially from the Commission and the Parliament, which are the two principal bodies uh, that, that we, we really are discussing here. Uh, and when it comes to the Parliament, for instance, I, I should say that Transparency International this morning blasted the Parliament for blocking accountability measures. So this is a very live issue. So with that, can I just ask you what kind of pushback uh, the Court of Auditors has experienced? And perhaps in particular, uh, you could reference the report of 2019, which was a sort of auditing report, an ethical frameworks report, where if I understand things correctly, freedom of mandate by some MEPs seemed to be almost freedom from scrutiny. Well, um, of course, Commission Parliament are made up mainly, they are made up of politicians. By definition, um, politicians are representatives of the people, um, and they feel that that is their mandate. They can speak to whoever they like, whenever they like, however they like. I was a politician myself, so this is not a criticism, of course, it's just, you know, and they are elected. So, basically, they are there because the people put them there. So whereas, for instance, when it comes to nominations to certain positions in the in European institutions, um, the nominees can go through certain um, checks on their background, on their moral integrity. Um, elected members do not do that. So I would say, first of all, put some responsibility on the political parties before they put their candidates out there because that, that is in itself a problem. Um, as regards the pushback on the reports, we, we, the, the Court of Orders has, has uh, um, made a couple of reports, uh, and you're referring to, to the 2019 report, uh, where there were various um, gaps identified. Um, now, it's this experience that I am going through with the Court of Orders, where all the recommendations are discussed and agreed to, with the, by agreed, I don't mean they're accepted, but before a report is published, the um, uh, Italia can, can, can confirm this, um, you are discussed with the, with the audit team, uh, which to me comes as a surprise. I'm used to a system where I listen to all sides and then I decide. I'm not used to a system where, before I decide, I have to agree on a conclusion, how the conclusion is going to be framed, how it's going to be phrased. Um, and um, in the case of the 2019 reports, there were various, various gaps identified, um, for instance, on, on the question of, of an overall strategy. So the parliament, for instance, we do not need an overall strategy on ethics. We just don't need it. So the, 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 court, the court of Orders has recommended an overall strategy, and the Parliament says we don't need it. Just, just, just one example. I mean, um, on the issue of verifying declarations of assets, uh, you, you practically take them at face value. Now, there again, my personal experience is different. A declaration of assets has to be verified, and it has to be updated from time to time, and it's just not not just your declaration of assets, but that of your spouse, of your minor children, or whatever. Uh, because obviously, uh, if one wants, to, because a declaration of assets serves, from, from my perspective, two, 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 uh, uh, two functions, two purposes. First of all, it's a question of uh, preempting or identifying possible conflicts of interest. But it's, it also serves for, uh, to, uh, as a basis, when you have your assets declared of corruption. In other words, if from one year to the next you declare a substantial increase in your assets, it has to be explained. Now, uh, if, if, if these are not verified from time to time on a regular basis, they don't serve any purpose. They're just there, filed away, and that's it. But, uh, but uh, as regards your, your, your question regarding the pushback, um, 
of course, the Court of Auditors, whenever it makes a recommendation, it is uh, very happy that those recommendations are taken on board and very disappointed when they are not taken on board because obviously they believe in they, we believe in those conclusions and we would be hopeful that the auditee would be embracing them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hissler. That's, that's, a, that's fascinating, uh, especially about the, uh, the way that these reports are uh, agreed to. Uh, ombudsman. Not the conclusion. Huh? Not necessarily the conclusion. Ombudsman, um, can I turn to you? What pushback would you identify in terms of some of the cases, some of the past cases? I, I guess I would think of your work around tobacco lobbying and the work about uh, past president uh, Barroso, who went to Goldman Sachs. Yeah, I, I suppose when I reflect on those particular cases, I'm thinking that, that what we're trying to do is to sort of lessen the degree of self-regulation uh, in, in the Commission. We don't have a role in relation to um, what the MEPs do that, that's, that's handled internally. Um, so in the case of, of President, former President Barroso, we got a, compl a few complaints in relation to the fact that he had uh, moved to Goldman Sachs uh, you know, and uh, uh, the circumstances in which that had been allowed by, by the Commission. Um, and uh, what we looked at, we weren't looking at, at him particularly, or at him as an individual, we were looking at how the Commission handled this. And um, we made a number of recommendations, some of which were accepted, including that uh, there would be a longer cooling off period for former presidents of the Commission and also commissioners. But we also uh, recommended that they, they broaden their three people on the Ad Hoc Ethics uh, Committee um, in, in the Commission. We wanted a, a broader range of expertise, different views. And we also asked for the power of, of own initiative investigation to be given to the Ethics Committee so that instead of just being asked on a case-by-case -case basis to investigate that they would have the power to do it themselves. Um, both were, both of those uh, recommendations were rejected by the Commission. And it goes back to the point I was making at the beginning. It's, you know, self-regulation. I think we're all we're saying citizens are much more aware of what, what, what constitutes a good ethics body. It's independent and it can choose its investigations and isn't told or instructed um, what to do. Tobacco lobbying, to me, was always a strange one. I mean, um, um, we recommended that all of the meetings that uh, the, the, the Commission has, at whatever level, uh, be um, proactively uh, published. I mean, they are obliged and they do publish uh, meetings with the, with the Secretary General, with the Cabinet, with the, with, the, with the Commissioner and so on. But we recommended that all meetings, and this was in line with the spirit of the UN Convention on Tobacco, which seeks to narrow the interaction between uh, tobacco lobbying and um, tobacco lobbyists and, and, uh, and administration. And honestly, I thought this was like an easy win for them and for, for us. What's the big deal? Just say, you know, that so-and-so met with so-and-so. Uh, and they, again, they, they, this, this was refused, which really does um, uh, puzzle me. Um, so there are two instances of where uh, we had got you know, uh, pushback. Uh, and I think w had they been implemented, I think it would have strengthened the trust of citizens in relation to um, how these matters are, are, are dealt with um, internally by, by the Commission. Uh, revolving doors, we've done loads of investigations into that. We did one involving 100 files of uh, Commission officials who had left uh, the Commission, not all to go into the private sector, but some into you know, civil society, academia, and so on. And we looked at how the Commission had uh, implemented its rules in relation to that. And we found that it was a very, I think it only happened on one or two occasions that people were prevented from taking up a post. Um, so again, we made recommendations in relation how they can, in a sense, police what happens afterwards. Um, some were taken up, some were not. So it's always very, very slow. We get tiny little things are, are agreed to. Well, not always tiny, sometimes quite significant ones, but it's push, push, push. And I was always hoping that when Cattergate happened that, you know, there's nothing like a... A uh, crisis to accelerate these things. I mean, the, the much vaunted autodarite in France was prompted by, you know, a crisis involving a minister and tax. But so, it's interesting to me to observe the impact of the huge scandal that was and is Cattergate on what actually emerges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, very interesting to hear from all the oversight bodies there on inability to inspect MEPs' offices. <laughs> ignored recommendations, 
and a resistance to basic transparency measures uh, at, the, at the European Commission. And what the Ombudsman said about all those hopes being raised uh, in the wake of Qatargate, you know, never letting a good scandal go to waste, there is this question, you know, sort of what happened to the momentum. And I think that's why I'll, I'll leap straight into this uh, next section. Um, and perhaps I can put the question to you, uh, Vice President Yorova. You know, you, you speak about the, you've spoken about the legal obstacles, right, to uh, a single body. We know that there are academics like uh, Professor Alemano who've put forward uh, solutions to this, that this is somehow surmountable. Um, <laughs> to what degree are these legal hurdles uh, the idea that such a model as well would perhaps be too French. Uh, the Ombudsman mentioned the, the French model. To what degree is all of this debate simply masking uh, a political unwillingness uh, to embrace these changes? Uh, and to what degree is it revealing that the institutions are just unwilling to cooperate? To what degree is this a political problem? Mm -hmm. I didn't speak about the legal obstacles before, did I? Not too much. <laughs> because I, I really think that this is the matter of good politics, good policy, and moral stance. And uh, by saying that, of course, we cannot uh, oversee uh, the legal uh, um, limitations uh, for the new body. To establish a new body, which uh, will uh, deal with the, with the ethical standards, uh, we uh, have a chance to do it as a legally sound, uh, efficient, meaningful body by means of the interinstitutional agreement. Why by such agreement? Because simply the body is not foreseen in the treaty. So this is not a legal excuse. This is not something which <laughs> uh, should be ignored. This is a key thing because if we sp should speak about the ethics body, which would have <clears throat> investigative and sanctioning uh, powers, we would need to have it uh, in, in, the, in the treaty. And why? Because uh, such, body, uh, such body's decision would be immediately challenged at the court for a good reason, because to investigate somebody and sanction, I can imagine that uh, there will be immediate reaction. So uh, this is what I mean, that we want to establish the ethics body, which will be legally sound. And I did not mean it as, a, as an excuse for taking weak political decision. It's, it's not like that. Uh, one procedural comment, uh, the... Uh, proposal for the ethics body, including its competencies, the, the scope, the, the, the personal scope, the, the composition procedures. Um, it will be the proposal of the Commission, which will appear on the table of other eight, eight institutions. We will have a political meeting, hopefully, hopefully still in uh, sometimes at the beginning of July. I, I, I do hope we will we will manage to have such meeting, and it will be kick off. It was it will be the momentum to start the common work on the final proposal on how the ethics body will look like. Yeah. So I, I just want want us to to imagine uh, that the commission's proposal is not set in stone. That we want the, all the institutions uh, to have the strongest possible ownership. And that's why they should be the co-creators of the final uh, scope and format of the, of the body. Saying that, I am not uh, indicating that I will, how many negatives I have there. I am not indicated, uh, indicating that I will not defend the Commission's proposal. I will, because I have many, many good reasons. But at the same time, it has to be an open discussion and, and uh, the subject for common work. I hear your conviction on the legal point, and I, I do take it on board. Um, but let me push you just a little bit more on the political dimension to all of this, because I think it's a little bit the elephant in the room. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, has Ms. Metzola got too much at stake in terms of her European ambitions within her own EPP group? Has Ms. von der Leyen, also in the EPP family, 
has she run out of political capital for doing this kind of ethical work? Mm. Would the will to put together a single unitary body be there but for these political issues? I am not here to assess uh, the, uh, the proposal of, of Madame Metzola. I spoke to the President Metzola and she was very constructive and she said, yes, let's work together on the strongest possible ethics body. So this is what I heard from her. This is, I think, from uh, what, we, what we can read through her for, for 14 points, that there is a really strong political will uh, to, to engage in uh, correcting. Or I spoke about corrections at the beginning. So in correcting the situation and increasing the trust of people. Um, but I will offer you another elephant in the room, maybe not in this room. Uh, I don't think the ethics body should serve as uh, the body replacing the in internal structures of the institutions. This is what I already said before, and now I want to be well understood. There are voices that uh, the individual cases, the, the assessment of declarations of assets and, and the post-mandate activities and, and so on, should be outsourced to the ethics body. My question is, why? Is it because uh, the internal structures are not able to do such objective assessment for the institution? That's a question mark. I have that feeling that it is the case, that this push for outsourcing means that we are not able to do it at home, internally, for many different reasons. That's for me, it's, it's important, and I don't want to sacrifice the ethics body to this. Thank you very much. Um, Vice President Barley, um, again, a little bit on the sort of political uh, side of things. What expectations do you have that creation of this new body, which will be in formation uh, in the run-up to the next European <coughs> elections, will it make a tangible difference for, let's say, S&D MEPs who uh, feel very damaged by Qatargate, again, uh, ahead of the next election? I mean. Many conservatives and right-wingers say that the scandal isn't their business. They can continue as they've always done with self-policing. Uh, and Transparency International, also this morning, heavily criticized President Metzola, herself a conservative, for being, quote, nowhere to be seen, unquote, in the reform effort. So my question is, uh, you're sitting next to Ms. Yurova. Uh, has she helped you? <laughs> has she helped... Uh, has she helped uh, the S&D and MEPs in the build-up to the, the next election, given all that's happened? Well, probably from all the people I've worked with on these issues, not only transparency, but everything that sort of goes with it, because it's a bigger picture, it's rule of law, if you, if you want. I know that Vera Yoruba is, is my closest ally. I can't, I don't know what is happening in the commission, you know, I, I have my presumptions. I am former social democrat, if it helps Very you. Very good, thank you. <laughs> no, but I know that she personally is always on the right side, that's what I can say. But of course you have constraints within your body, so I don't want to elaborate on that, but that is, that is how it is. Now, I was very grateful that it, within the parliament, there was an, there was a, um, there was an agreement that this was not a party political thing. And, and it was the, the Conservatives and, and Renew uh, who, 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 who stated that. And from, apart from very few incidents, they acted accordingly. They said, this is a problem that we have all together now. And, and this is, as, as it was already said, this is a criminal offence. This is something that is not usual for a parliament that can happen just like this. This is a very singular incident. So, so I was very impressed by this approach to tackle this together. But of course, you have your convictions. These convictions were there before Katagate and they still are there. And they don't purely go along party political lines. So, so um, Within the Conservatives, there are some who would like to go further. Within the Social Democrats, there are some who wouldn't want to go that far. 
And that's the same in every political group. But we have taken, of course, a decision to, to implement our 15 points and to apply them to ourselves, even if the parliament doesn't go that far. Um, so, so we will do this because we feel a, a responsibility out of this um, scandal. And, and in general, we, we are very much committed to this, to this idea of transparency. But um, I, think, I think you said it. Um, trans, uh, some think that free mandate means, no, you said it, means freedom of, of being scrutinized. And that is, that is true for some. And we don't only have this, in, in, uh, have this position in, in, in this context, but also in others. When it comes to financial businesses, um, we also see this. And we even have those who say, OK, then let's go and declare something. And we have the saying, OK, for them, that is declare and don't care. I mean, then I say that, for example, I, I, I own assets here and there, but it's still, then, I, then I'm, I'm transparent but I can still do whatever I want. Um, and that, of course, is not, not the idea. I mean, if you have a conflict of interest, there should be more, more consequence than just making it transparent. Um, and, th and there's one thing I really have to stress, because, because it has been mentioned several times. Even the resolution of the parliament does not ask for um, the competence of sanctioning of the ethics body. No, I think nobody does that, because we are all completely aware that that would need a, a change of treaties. Um, so, so investigation, yes. And, and we, we do have that. Um, I mean, even our advisory board that we already have in the European Parliament has um, the possibility to, to, to ask for external um, support um, investigating something. So um, I think this is not such a big step, but nobody asks for sanctioning and you'll, you'll Certainly through the process of the formation of the ethics body, you'll keep fighting for that. Absolutely. Right. Um, Mr. Hissler, um, can I, we're on the topic of the parliament. Um, there's some work that's been done by uh, the court on how parliamentary assistance, and again, here we get back to you know, how in the real world we find out about wrongdoing how parliamentary assistants don't feel themselves empowered to report wrongdoing, to be whistleblowers. Uh, what did the court conclude needed to be done here? And what does your experience in Malta tell us about the power that's needed uh, by effective ethics bodies uh, more generally? Um, well, first of all, as regards whistleblowing, um, I think from surveys that were conducted, most, most would have replied that they do not feel that their colleagues would actually report wrongdoing. So, uh, and if they did report wrongdoing, they probably wouldn't feel protected. Now, of course, whistleblowers are vulnerable. Whatever kind of protection we try to give them, they are always vulnerable. I've dealt, I've dealt with many whistleblowers uh, and in in uh, in my former former role, I uh, I did I did suggest amendments to the law that would empower the Commission for Standards to give whistleblower status to 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 uh, individuals who would uh, um, uh, reveal wrongdoing, internal wrongdoing. Um, of course, there's always a tricky issue. People in general don't like whistleblowers. Colleagues don't like whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are, by definition, people who've betrayed someone. And so they are looked upon in a certain way. But they are, it's probably one of the few ways of getting to, to uncover wrong uh, misconduct. And on that point, I mean, this is, a, this is, again, on your agenda, isn't it, uh, Smiley? And you'll fight for that, too. Great. Now, I'm going to open the floor uh, for questions. Can I just have an initial show of hands as to the interest in the room. Go on, don't be shy. Yes, very good, very good. Terrific. OK, um, I did see a uh, question from Mikhail uh, from Transparency International. Is there a microphone that's going around, or we'll just invite you to stand up? So very good. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you to the panel for the really interesting discussion. And, I just want to say, first of all, that uh, 
We're so impressed by the work that you've done, uh, Ombudsman, in the last 10 years because there's been so much progress in terms of bringing these issues uh, to light and also getting the institutions to, to act. And the institutions don't always do everything you ask, uh, but what is clear is that when you bring out a report, and they sit up and listen, and, and that's uh, really taken the work of this office to a whole new level, and it's incredibly important, I think, for citizens and for, <clears throat> for European democracy. Um, we brought out a, a, a small report this morning on progress on the Qatar gate reform since December last year, and uh, the, um, the, the main conclusion from that, uh, I think, and I think it's also apparent from this discussion, is that very little is actually happening, and in particular at the Parliament. Uh, and uh, that if you look at the list of reforms that was proposed by the Parliament in December, <coughs> endorsed by President Metzola in her 14-point plan and then by the Conference of Presidents, the, re the only real progress that's been made is introducing staff training. Um, and um, the sitting MEPs so far haven't really felt anything. They haven't had to do anything in order to improve the transparency and integrity regime of the Parliament. It's quite the opposite. Um, you know, we had two MEPs who were found guilty of um, harassing their staff out of apparently 34 complaints, according to Politico, since 2019. These two MEPs still sit in their political groups, including yours, uh, Madam Vice President. Uh, after Qatar Gate, 100 travel declarations were submitted uh, in the space of a few weeks because MEPs realized that they had not been complying with their obligation to report uh, travel and events paid for by third parties. Almost all of these declarations are from countries that, are, uh, that, that are, don't respect uh, the same democratic uh, values as we do. There are sanctions that the Parliament can impose for submitting these declarations late, as they were. The Parliament hasn't done anything, maybe because the President was also one of the ones who didn't submit them on time. And there are so many examples where the Parliament isn't even applying its own rules. And I fully agree here with the point that the Commissioner is making, which is the Parliament should not be hiding behind the need for a strong ethics body, because there is a need for a strong ethics body. It should be doing now what it can and should already be doing now on the basis of the rules that exist at the moment. And so my question really to you, Madam Vice President, is what are you going to do to make sure that six months after Qatar Gate, the Parliament is finally going to introduce the reforms for which it doesn't need any political support from others. It can do it all by itself. Well, the truth to that is um, we have a lot of different bodies who have to implement. Uh, we have the AFCO committee, we have uh, the bureau, we have the COP. And I mean, I mean, okay, I'm getting into trouble now, but of course <laughs> there are people who don't want it to go quickly because we have elections next year. And the longer you have the topic on the table, the longer you can talk about Qatar Gate, and um, that is also a political point for some. That's one point. The other point is that um, I, I'm, I'm in the Bureau, and the Bureau has only very few of these 14 measures to take. We have taken one, which is a cooling off period. Um, there is another one that has been taken, which is the access, uh, the limitation of access to former former MEPs, and we're going to take one uh, hopefully uh, still this month or next month, uh, which concerns the whistleblowers, which for me is the most important one, actually, because it is the only one if we talk about what could have prevented this scandal from happening or what could have revealed it earlier, it's the only one. And it's a crying shame that the European institutions don't apply their own legislation, which is a general problem. <laughs> but that we don't um, have rules according to the whistleblower directive, I find ridiculous, and I hope that we will get there very soon. But there, for example, now it is being said, um, the staff has to be involved here. We are at the moment having uh, elections for, for the staff representation, so we will wait until the staff representation has constituted itself which will already bring us, uh, bring us a bit further. And we have, we have introduced a two-step approach in the, in, the, in the Bureau, which I find a good thing. In the f with the former Secretary General, we got, uh, we got a proposal and we voted on it, bam. And this time we have discussion and we might ask things and then they come back to us, so process is a bit longer. But you're absolutely right, we have to be quicker and a lot of us are saying this publicly and internally. 
Um, I, I don't, I mean, to be very clear, um, uh, President Metzola is not amongst them who want to slow it down. I'm very, I'm very sure about that. She's, she's doing her utmost, um, but not everybody is doing it. That's what I would say. We are in the, in the, in the Bureau are pushing, and I'm very, very hopeful that we will have the uh, whistleblower decision before the, before the summer break. I would, I would, our intention was to have everything decided before the summer break. Um, AFCO is also sort of at the end of it, but there, I'm not sure of the time, time frame. Can I bring in Mr. Itala to uh, talk a bit to these points? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, it was uh, two weeks ago, very important improvement in Parliament when they voted this arts, uh, uh, resolution. There was one article by a rapporteur uh, saying that they should to give the access for all of to MEP's offices and premises and uh, recognize uh, our mandate for code of conduct in Parliament. That's what we have negotiated many years. And now the plenary voted that there. I, I'm really happy for that, that some development but it's such a resolution, it needs to be implemented still by the Bureau. But uh, when the whole plenary voted in favour, so there's something good to happen in, in the Parliament in this sense. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just need to note that uh, Ms. Yurova is going to have to leave at 11.45. So any burning questions for the Vice President, please, uh, for the Vice President? I shall pick on you next then, yes. And please... I will, I will be short. <laughs> so we can take both. And please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Christian Beck. I work for uh, Daniel Freund, who is rapporteur in the European Parliament for the EU ethics body, uh, the, the vice president uh, that we, we met already. Um, uh, thank you very much. The, the, my question would be to reply to what you said, that it is indeed a question whether the EU ethics body should replace the bodies of the individual institutions, whether a, a common external body would be better suited than like each institution dealing with their own problems inside. <laughs> and, and I would argue that th there have been indications that for both of our institutions that could be an advantage to have a more external uh, sort of, of checks, investigation and proposing what then the responsibles could, could do, like in, in the European Parliament, we have 26 cases of violations of the Code of Conduct with, uh, without a single financial penalty imposed. I, I don't think that's, that's indicating a strong uh, body. Um, it's probably mentioned in the analysis of TI as well. And um, in, in the Commission, former Commissioner Avramopoulos asked whether he could join um, Mr. Panzeri's organization, and instead of checking <laughs> what the former commissioner proposed that like they, they have uh, uh, not dangerous funding. Th this was never checked on, on the basis of documents. It was not insisted that he could only do this function when the organization would have e effectively registered and published these documents. Instead, everybody believed the former commissioner because in the end of the day, it's people working in the context of the commission. It's not external. It's not it's, it's not this additional credibility that, in our analysis, that could have. So I, I wonder if, if, if you believe that the, the EU institutions are inherently better than the institutions of the French Republic, where it was decided that the Haute Autorité would be better suited doing this ex more externally than within the institutions that have been responsible before. Thank you. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I can, exp I'll, I'll, try and ex I'll try and expand on that very briefly. I mean, let me put it in more sort of journalistic terms. Don't, don't um, give me a chance to, to answer like that. <laughs> and then you can come back to our, our other colleague. What's really to stop, I, I mean, if you think about what happened in the, uh, in the Cruz case, if you think about the Avramopoulos case, what's really to stop sitting and departing commissioners getting high paid work? right, involving these conflicts of interest in the future? Mm. There, are, there are three things. Uh, first of all, the internal uh, ethics committee has to work full steam. Yeah? And it's again the same story Mr. Italo said, let us do own work. 
This is exactly it. So uh, the Commission uh, Independent Ethics uh, Committee uh, is working, is assessing the cases. Uh, the second layer is the reputational blow to everybody who is at stake. And I think that it was case of Neri Cruz, it was case of Mr. Barroso, uh, not sure about uh, Dimitris Avramopoulos, uh, where, where the case is now. And, uh, well, we are all accountable to real people, to the voters. We are uh, scandalized in the media. Sometimes we deserve it. <laughs> we don't have mandates from the gods. Yeah? So that's why I mean reputational blow, which is coming, is always uh, also a big punishment for everybody. And sometimes it is a stop for the people to continue in politics. And the third layer, and it is what we are working now on, it's the ethics body. Because the ethics body, will, you, will, you will read the proposal, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, not be tasteless. It will, uh, we will agree with the institutions on the standards, on the rules, and they will have to be implemented and enforced internally in each institution. And where are the teeth? Yeah. Well, here, here is the pressure that the institutions who will be part uh, of the ethics body will have the obligation to, to in, in embed the rules into their internal rules and to, to implement that, to, to enforce it and to uh, sanction in case uh, somebody will fail to do that. And so there would be sanctions between the institutions? In, 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 inside the institutions. Okay. Huh? Okay. And <clears throat> One of the, uh, before we let you go. And, and the yeah. comparison with the French body, well, uh, I don't know uh, whether we didn't speak about the money here. We plan the body which will cost 0 0.6, uh, uh, 600,000 euro a year. Three people of the staff and uh, the secretariat. And you can, uh, throw stones on me <laughs> and say, say that uh, the ethics cannot be uh, paid by money. But it is also uh, a factor for us to establish the, the body which will uh, be uh, efficient and also uh, eco economic and uh, that we are not creating the, the new office which will not only have a weak position because there is no, it's not foreseen in the treaty, but also it will require a lot of money to, to is, establishing the office. I will give you an example. Uh, the, in the commission, we have 5,000 disciplinary cases in 2020. Uh, and it was uh, uh, handled by our internal structure. Just imagine if only part of the cases would have to go to the French-like uh, body, uh, how many people would be needed to do that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> before, we, before we let you go, I mean, one of the other issues that has arisen as part of our conversation this morning is the political messaging uh, that the ethics body might provide, right? It, it's either an opportunity or a lost opportunity to reassure vo voters that uh, Brussels is cleaning itself up. Is there part of the way that the ethics body is going to be rolled out that will be a message to voters uh, ahead of the next elections? Will there be a moment that you foresee where that can happen? I think the next, next week the voters will be yawning. It's nothing so sexy, okay, so Brussels established another body. What will be important? And there, therein lies the problem. Well, I, I am realistic. I sometimes go to, to a pub in Czechia, yeah? so I, I, I hear the real troubles the people have. But what will become a real message, I think, for the, for the voters will be the, the standards themselves. Because there will be clear set of standards regarding travel expenditures, uh, post-mandate activities, gifts, uh, I don't know, different kind of privileges which should be pushed to the absolute minimum. The people suffer in Europe, and many people suffer, and I think that they don't want to see privileges. Uh, and so this will be something which has to be explained to the general public before the elections. And here is the timing issue, because if we manage to establish the ethics body, 
uh, to start working on the first set of stan agreed standards, it should be done before the elections. Uh, because uh, the people will expect us to deliver on that, to say, yes, we want your trust. We want your vote and we will behave according to these rules. And the rules would have to be also simple and understandable. Thank you very much. We'll let you go. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Jurova. I'm leaving. Uh, Enjoy and thank you very much. It was inspirative debate. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So I saw a few other hands up. Please don't be shy. Uh, please, can I? Uh, Yes, second row there. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ovidian Ratziu. I'm from the Inspection and Control Office of Frontex. Maybe uh, one more time, because we missed your My intro. name is Ovidian Ratziu. I'm from the Inspection and Control Office of Frontex. Um, my question would have been, is the EU ethics body also overseeing the EU agencies, or is it simply just meant for, for the EU institutions as an attempt, like you said, for Brussels to clean itself out. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Actually, uh, <laughs> it's really, I mean, it, this question of the agencies, right, is, is a fascinating one. And in fact, uh, I would turn to Mr. Hissler to some degree to shed some light on this, because at least the court has audited the agencies. And I think a few of them came up. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was there was an audit uh, on on one of the agencies. By the way, these agencies are some um, special reports are sampled. So it doesn't mean that because something is found lacking in one agency, that's the only agency that has that problem. It is very likely that there are similar problems in other agencies as well. Uh, I, I'm saying this because I wouldn't would like to single out the agency. As, as if it's doing something wrong and everybody else is, is, is squeaky clean. Um, but with revolving doors, for instance, there was an issue with revolving doors and agencies, mainly because uh, agencies, especially higher temporary staff, so there's a high turnover of staff, and they tend to, to um, take, take on um, jobs um, that, that could be controversial. Um, but yes, I, I'm sure that Vera would have the agencies in mind. Um, uh, I think the agencies are also, have already been invited to form part of the transparency register. I don't think they have taken it on board, but there was an invitation, if I'm not mistaken, to be part of the transparency register. Um, so the, the likelihood is that, that it would. I mean, the idea, I'm sure, is to include the entire, all the components of the, of the, of the, of the galaxy. I mean, um, so... Uh, but at, at, the end of, at the end of the day, uh, it is in everybody's interest to send the right message out there. Of course, the political side of this debate, the, or the, think in terms of the next elections. The oversight uh, bodies do not really care about the next elections. We, we, we would like to see things improve independently of the time frames when uh, we don't have to fit into any time frames related to elections. So this is just to, <laughs> to make is, the point. Which is a very interesting point because the more that we look at a deadline, uh, perhaps the less chance, the, the greater the chance we reach a lowest common denominator result. So, yes. so deadlines are not always helpful in that regard. They, they worry me. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Barley. But I, I, I found very interesting what the Commissioner just said, because, of course, in the end, it is also a question of resources. And if we now include all the agencies and we stick to, 600, to a budget of 600,000 euros, I mean, imagine how many controls you can actually progress in. And, and um, uh, sorry, I forgot we're going to vote on the conditionality uh, um, mechanism uh, next time. And I'm fighting there for for a better control because we have the rules and and that is that is my criticism and it's unfortunate that Vera Europa is not there anymore my criticism with this with this um, plan to set up this sort of new ethics body because we will get an, another set of rules but we will not get a better implementation and what I find even more important a better control 
For the transparency register, I don't know how many people we have who actually take care of it. I think it's something like two or three. And they are busy with just handling it, just doing the, the, the stuff you need to do. They don't have any capacity to, to, to control. And I don't blame them for it. So, so we have to rely even there on the goodwill and the good faith and the culture, which, which works with probably 90%, but we're not going to get the other 10%. So if we, I, 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 I see the advantage of including more, more institutions. I'm not suggesting but if that, that, if that means that controls become even more unlikely, I mean, I used to be a, a, a judge the, the, to, to, to diminish um, the crimes. You do not need higher, higher sanctions. You need a more likelihood to be, to be caught. That's the point that keeps people from doing the wrong things. And we don't have that. And it, I don't see it coming. Thank you. Mr. Itala. I think that uh, I don't know exactly how this will go, but uh, at least in general, the ethics standards has to be same everywhere. Because if somebody has much lower standards, it's, it's always a reputational risk. And that's, uh, the citizens think always EU as a one. Uh, they don't make difference if it's uh, agency or parliament or something else. And like in the Qatar case, now the most, most of the MEPs are really hardworking, high ethical standards, but the reputation went from everyone with the one scandal, done. And it takes years to get it back. And that's not fair. That's why we need to have this everywhere. Thank you. Standards. Thank you. Can I just say something, Jason, for that? Yes. Uh, just in terms of resources and all of that, in my experience, if the, if the EU politically generally wants something to happen, it can throw huge amounts of money at it. And if it doesn't want something to happen, it starves it of money. It is as simple as that. And whether that's the transparency register, whether that's the resources that are put into the Commission in relation to dealing with access to documents requests, whether it's this body, you will know how serious it is by the amount of money it sends. And if people say it's a large amount of money relative to others, well, think about the amount of money it'll save in terms of the work that it does. No. Yes, I mean, 600,000 is a very resonant figure when you think about the amount of cash that was in suitcases. Again, not very far from this building. Um, in fact, inside this building, if I remember correctly. Um, this is just a coincidence, OK? We were <laughs> We were not making a point. My colleagues assured me that this was the only place in Brussels that was available today. You know, and I naturally believe them. <laughs> the roots of the issue. Um, so uh, can I have a quick show of hands for any other questions in the room? Uh, yes, uh, question over there, please. There's a mic. Please introduce yourself. Better. Uh, I'm Nina Katzemich from Lobby Control um, in Germany, and yeah, I would shortly like to join the praise of TI to the Ombudsman. Thank you very much for the important work, and thank you for the important discussion here. We also see the point, as many here, that there's a huge problem of enforcement and oversight. And so I was really interested to hear from Mrs. Bali that the uh, advisory committee has the right to ask for external investigating support. And I would like to ask two questions. First one, did it ever use this? I never heard of that, but maybe um, I don't know. I don't know everything by far, so that would be interesting. And second question, um, how is the parliament going to strengthen its own advisory body as long as, or let's say it differently, there's not, the, the ethics committee we would have wished for is not coming, so I think every institution has to do it on its own and the system of self-control, and we would like to know what concretely the parliament is going to do to strengthen its own ethics body advisory committee. Okay, you're in the hot seat again. Yes, well, um, the provision talks about external support. It does not say explicitly external support for investigation. But what I meant is that um, everything that is being said about secret, uh, uh, the secrecy in, in relation to uh, freedom of mandate, apparently if you seek for s external support, you, you have to you know, lay down the case. So uh, I, I said that as an example for that freedom of mandate does not limit you 
from uh, ser searching for external support. Um, oh God, I'm going, yeah, okay. This advisory board, we, we when Qatargate came up, we found that really close to nobody in the parliament, I'm talking about MEPs, knew that this board apps existed, merely existed. So, so at least that has changed. Um, but um, the, the question what to do with it, of course, is, is in exactly the same range that I described earlier. There are those who want to make it an, a proper ethics body with the, the um, competences I described, as long as we don't have a, an ethics body for, for all the institutions. And there are some who don't want it to do any more than it did up to now. And this goes along as, as it is in a parliament, along your, your political conviction. And um, so, so I don't think that the, the outcome there, um, I don't see it coming. I don't see it coming to strengthen this body as a true ethics body with, with investigation powers. I mean, it's not in the 14 points anyway. And uh, we will be happy to, to get through these 14 points. And of course, there are, there are a lot of MEPs who, who say these are first steps and we want to go further afterwards, after this implementation. But it's, it's definitely not, not every MEP who wants that. Thank you very much. Now, we're, we're very nearly at the end, and I'd like to thank the panel, you and the audience, and of course the, the European Ombudsman for bringing us together to discuss this critical issue for the future of Europe. And uh, if I could just invite the Ombudsman to close the conference for us. I think in a way we were only getting started. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether the hall is free for the afternoon, but anyway. Uh, look, I want to, I want to thank the, the, the panelists. I know it, it can be all sorts of things they have to be mindful of in terms of what they say and can't say, uh, but to the extent that they, that they were open, I, I thank them for that. I also thank James for asking some of the, the, the questions that we were too polite to ask, um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm not sure how much clarity has, you know, come from from our discussion. We should know more, obviously, after Thursday and when, when the Parliament finishes doing its its business. But I think we can all agree that, uh, well, it's as complicated as you want it to be complicated, I guess. And and the the elephant in the room is definitely politics. <laughs> of course, it is. I mean, it always is. And you know, generally, the the, the political grouping split along predictable and traditional lines in relation to whether they whether they'd love a strong ethics body or whether they're rather lukewarm about it. And I think that has to be acknowledged. But I think in all of these things, it is really important not to fool the people, not to offer them something and, and, and almost pretend that it's going to be a particular thing. And then politics comes in and, and, and dilutes it. That's not fair. It is not right. Uh, and I think when, when people, when this was first talked about pre catergate uh, you know, it was, there was going to be an independent ethics body. And I think what most people uh, commonly understand would be that it would be independent. It would not be told what to do. It could work on its own initiative within its own mandate and powers. That it would have strong powers of investigation. I mean, I think that's the strength of my uh, office. It's not that people have to follow our recommendations. Thankfully, in general, they, they do. But our magic power is the power to investigate, to see whatever we need to see in order to put the report out, and then whatever happens, uh, happens. And that's really important. And, and then the third power is, is, is some form of sanctioning. I mean, the Autotari Day, as I understand it, doesn't impose sanctions itself, but it can refer to prosecutors or back to parliament or, or whatever it does. And I remember being very struck one time when my poor woman who attempted to improve my French uh, was, uh, was something, I think I was going to meet the Autodorite and I asked her, are French people aware of the Autodorite? And she said, oh yeah, very much. And uh, I said, and what would the impression be of it that it's a, that it's a strong body? Yeah. And uh, I know there might be reluctance to model things on, on, on particular member states' uh, institutions, but it has the hallmarks 
Uh, and I think what emerges, certainly in the short to medium term, is, is not going to have those hallmarks. So I think the most that can be done, yes, I think it would be wonderful to have a body that does create those high standards and that we all agree to, uh, to implement them. But that within the institutions, and particularly the most important ones, the Commission and the Parliament, we mustn't forget the Council either. Uh, they're lurking there somewhere. Um, uh, you know, um, that, that their own ethics bodies are revamped, that it's not self-regulation, that they don't just sit there waiting for somebody to ask them to investigate something and then, you know, uh, and so on. So that's where it's really important. And people aren't stupid. Uh, and I think everybody has to think about what it's going to be like when they go before the electorate next, next May or June or whatever it is, um, and people ask a question. Uh, and the extent to which they can bridge the gap between what was promised back in 2019 and what is emerging now will determine how much trust citizens will put in this. So uh, a lot of work to be done, but I think I always believe in naming things, and I think the more that politicians in particular who are, and I do accept their bona fides in relation to this, tell us what's going on, tell us what the pressures are, uh, then the more there can be uh, citizen understanding and citizen support for what they're trying to do. So I thank you all, and uh, I think there's, are we buying them coffee and sandwiches? We are, okay, well, generous of us. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much, and thank you to the panel, thank you all, thank you. Thank you.